Commons in London. So it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to this special session on special drawing rights together with our colleagues at the International Monetary Fund. Uh, my name is Liam Byrne. I'm honoured to be the chair of the Parliamentary Network on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and this is one of um, a number of special sessions that we'll be organising between now uh, and the spring meetings uh, next year uh, to help zero in on some of the key issues that are uh, of real concern uh, to parliamentarians uh, around the world. Now, what we heard at the annual meetings back in October is the sheer scale of the damage that COVID has done to the global economy, something like $19 trillion uh, of lost output. But crucially, uh, real clarity from IMF policymakers that if we make bad decisions over the next few years, we risk something like another five trillion dollars uh, in lost economic output between now and 2024. Conversely, if we make some good decisions, we could add something like nine trillion dollars to cumulative um, net income. So there is uh, an awful lot at stake in getting decisions right over the next few months and over the next few years. Three key messages, however, have emerged from um, the last month and a half between the annual meetings uh, and COP26, which has, has just concluded um, in Glasgow. Perhaps most important of all, a clear message that the crisis is not over. Uh, the IMF estimates that we are still something like $20 billion uh, short of the investment that we need to get a global vaccination program that genuinely delivers uh, global safety and vaccination uh, against coronavirus. Second, a real clarity that many policymakers and many parliamentarians are feeling um, very personally, very, very high levels of debt. Uh, and over the next five years, something like one and a half trillion dollars um, of emerging economy debt uh, will fall due. So some of the challenges around how we raise the taxes to pay for that, how we refinance that, how we restructure that. Um, these, are, this, these are questions which are fast coming at us. Um, and then, of course, we saw at COP26 a real focus on loss and damage, um, a real disappointment at some of the shortfalls that we've seen in climate finance, um, but lots of determination from parliamentarians around the world that we have now got to do a much better job at driving up towards that $100 billion a year in um, climate finance um, that is going to be needed um, if we are to hit the, the Paris targets. So when you put that story together, many of us as parliamentarians feel that we have to somehow square this terrible triangle of how we exit the crisis safely um, how we deal with rising debt levels and then how we mobilize finance um, to help hit the paris deadlines too that is a very very difficult triangle uh, to somehow square it's almost as if the world needs a great booster jab uh, and actually thanks to our colleagues at the imf and the shareholders of the imf we happen to have manufactured one, $650 billion in special drawing rights uh, that have now been issued to uh, IMF uh, shareholders, um, but which by and large are still sitting in the exchange accounts or in the central banks. So one of the reasons that we wanted to organize this session is to help parliamentarians accelerate the conversation about how that money is rechanneled back to countries that need it more than richer countries. Here in the United Kingdom, we have 20 billion pounds that has just arrived in our exchange equalization account. And that is not money that we currently need to support our reserve position, but we are amongst those countries that have only made very modest promises uh, for how much is, is rechanneled. And crucially, as everybody said, when we issued the call for SDRs earlier in the year, the crisis is now. So we cannot delay in actually getting the rechanneling process um, on the road. So um, we are super grateful to our colleagues from the International Monetary Fund for spending some time with us today um, to go through um, some of the positions and some of the questions that you might have. I know lots of us will be asking questions like, how do we maximize the percentage of SDRs which are rechanneled? What is the right fraction of the SDR issue? Um, to rechannel, and um, how do we just technically and in accounting terms make sure that that money is moved from exchange accounts and central banks into fiscal action? Uh, and then crucially, how do we really do a good job at multiplying and leveraging that money 
what kind of funding needs to go through new trusts being set up by the IMF, and what kind of resource needs to go through multilateral development banks, what's the kind of deployment strategy that helps us maximise um, the bang for the buck that we get. So um, before I um, invite our speakers to open the batting uh, for us today, let me just say two words of housekeeping. Um, first, uh, we have interpretation available. And um, so if you are joining us on a desktop today, um, you will see at the bottom of your screens uh, a little button for interpretation. Um, please, uh, if you're going to be speaking later, please, please click on the button that you want to hear a translation in. Um, if you're joining us um, on an iPad um, or a phone, um, you'll be able to see the interpretation um, button up in the more where you have three dots at the top of your screen. Um, if you click on that, you should be able to navigate your way um, to the interpretation accounts. Uh, and then the second point to make is that I'm going to do my best to bring in as many uh, questions and answers as possible. Um, it would help me and help us get through uh, the next hour and a half as quickly as possible. Um, if you could just put your question in the chat um, and I will um, pick that up from there um, and put it to um, our special guests. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm really um, delighted to be able to introduce um, Gulam Shaba, who is the Deputy Director, Strategy, Policy and Review Department at the IMF. Um, and Mr Shaba is going to be followed by Charlene Gust. Uh, Chief of Concessional Financing Division uh, in the Finance Department um, at the IMF. Uh, they're going to spend about 10-15 uh, minutes just um, opening the batting for us uh, and then I'm delighted we can be able to hand over uh, to a couple of my parliamentary colleagues. Uh, but Gwilym, let me um, hand the floor first to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much to you, William, and thank you to the Parliamentary Network for organising this discussion today. That's a very, very... Um, um, valuable for us. Um, you mentioned the you mentioned the needs and the fact that the crisis is not over. Uh, this is very true. Um, with Charlene, our presentation will focus on the situation in low-income countries and the reforms that were approved in July to improve to enhance the IMF support to income countries. Just to recall that in March earlier this year, we published a report um, uh, which stated that uh, for low-income countries. The estimate of the needs for the five years to come, 2021 to 2025, is a need of uh, in the range of $200 billion needed to step up the spending response to the COVID crisis and rebuild or maintain external buffers, and an additional $250 billion in investment spending to accelerate convergence with um, advanced economies. So again, we will focus in this first uh, session on, on the low-income countries and the reforms to the PRGT, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, um, if you allow me to spend um, some seconds to put on the screen our uh, presentation, let me try to do that um, quickly. I don't know if you see the... Um... Yeah, we can see it. <clears throat> okay. So let's do that. Oops. Improve. So um, <clears throat> we have a presentation which is structured in two parts. <clears throat> Um, first, I will provide a brief overview of where we stand in terms of uh, IMF lending to low-income countries and why uh, reforms were needed, and we will turn then to the uh, um, um, reforms that were approved in July. On the first item, um, the IMF increased dramatically its support to low-income countries during the pandemic. As you see on the chart, IMF lending to low-income countries surged to $13.2 billion in 2020, more than six times the pre-COVID average. A record number of 50 low-income countries benefited from fund spending in 2020. This could actually be done thanks to the rapid adoption in April 2020 of a temporary doubling of funds limits to emergency financing and the streamlining of procedures to allow rapid delivery of large-scale support. Perhaps I should stay uh, at, this, at this point of the presentation, um, as you know, that IMF loans to low-income countries are provided with, with favorable financial conditions. Loans are provided at zero interest rate. They have longer maturities and grace periods than regular loans provided to non-low-income non countries. And for that reason, they are not available to all members of the fund, but only to a subset of them, the low-income countries, based on eligibility criteria. Currently, we have 69 of the 119 members of the IMF which are eligible to the concessional loans of the IMF, 
And as you know, those loans are administered through a specific and separated trust fund, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, PRGT. In addition to learning, I just wanted to recall that the fund also supported low-income countries during the crisis through debt relief. Thanks to contributions from members, the fund could provide debt relief to 31 low-income countries for almost $1 billion. And the fund also contributed actively, together with the World Bank, to the implementation of the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative, the, the SSI. And we are now contributing to the, to the implementation of the G20 Common Framework for Debt Treatment beyond the GSSI. You mentioned, Liam, the importance of debt challenges, and we may come back to that in the questions if, if, you, if you so wish. Now, on this slide, you see that we have already moved to another phase of the crisis in the spring of 2021. The graph shows IMF lending to low-income countries from January 2020 to the summer of 2021, and you see three different phases. In the first phase, from March to July 2020, the IMF dispersed quickly more than $11 billion, quasi-exclusively through emergency financing. In the second phase, from August to December 2020, new lending was modest, with only $1.5 billion dispersed, equally split between emergency financing and multi-year programs. And since last spring, we have entered another phase with a pickup in lending and very importantly, a shift to multi-year programs, that is the red dotted line that you have on the graph, in line with the transition from the emergency response to a more structural approach. Now, <clears throat> going forward, we expect the demand for fund support to remain. Yeah, after that, mm -hmm. after this, go um, So, I said, <laughs> Uh, the demand for fund support should remain in the year, in the year to come, uh, um, uh, in line with the fact that the pandemic will unfortunately have enduring effects, in particular for low-income countries, where the recovery is projected to be less favorable than for advanced economies. What you see on the graph on the left is a comparison of the evolution of GDP per capita for low-income countries and for advanced economies. The green lines show the GDP per capita for advanced economies, with the dark green line being the pre-COVID projection and the light green line being the current post-COVID projection. And you have the same in blue for the uh, low-income countries. What you see is a much less favorable situation for low-income countries than for advanced economies. Advanced economies will surpass the pre-COVID projection by 2022. Whereas, as you see on the graph, the situation will remain below pre-COVID projection for low-income uh, countries for the years to come. On the right, you have basically the same um, uh, narrative, but uh, through a different angle. The graph shows the level of income convergence between low-income countries and advanced economies, the dotted line being the uh, projection pre-COVID, and the red line being our current projection. So what you see on this graph is that not only has the income convergence reversed during the pandemic, but the pace of convergence post-COVID is also slower than it was pre-COVID. Turning to the projection of demand for fund financing, well, it would be fair to say that the low-income countries have limited financing options to respond to the crisis, jumpstart the economies, and cover the high financing needs they face to support the development, which leads to an expectation of high level of demand for fund support in the coming years, as you see on the graph. We expect this demand to, to be more than four times the historical average. Hence, the motivation for reforms. Centerpiece of the reasoning is the limits that constrain what countries can borrow under IMF concessional facilities, which are, as you know, uh, set as a multiple of IMF quota. Given the size of emergency support during the pandemic, given also the need uh, going forward, a large part of the borrowing space um, that countries would have had would have been severely constrained absent any reform. So let's turn to the reforms adopted in July. There were actually two interconnected dimensions to form the reform package. One was uh, to enhance the support for income countries. The other was to deploy a funding strategy to get the resources that are necessary to back the enhanced support. In terms of enhanced support, the cornerstone of the reform 
was an increase by 45% of the access limits to IMF concessional facilities. So those facilities which are administered under the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, the PRDT. This is very straightforward. Since July, low-income countries have the possibility to borrow 45% more than before through the PRDT and the concessional financing terms of the PRDT. In addition, and very importantly, the poorer low-income countries, currently 34 countries, have now the possibility to receive all IMF financing through PRDT loans at zero interest rate, whereas they were constrained before by a hard cap beyond which they could not borrow any further under the PRDT and had to go to uh, uh, more uh, costly resources from the uh, fund. And lastly, the reform simplified the rules to identify among the richer low-income countries the one who need to blend, what we call blend, which is that they must borrow partly under the PRGT and partly under the less favorable conditions of the general resources of the fund. Whatever the technical it is, the key message is that the um, framework was adapted to meet higher demand with more capacity to support the poorer countries. I just wanted to put on this slide um, the past and new limits. I certainly don't intend to go through all details of this table. But just to uh, give a sense of direction, which is clear, the new limits, which are the column, uh, the numbers in the column on the right, are higher than they were before, which is the column in the middle. And very importantly, there is no hard cap anymore for countries, uh, the poorer countries, at least, uh, that can borrow under the PRGT using what is called the exceptional access. Now, higher lending comes inevitably with higher risks for the fund and therefore the need for enhanced safeguards. This is actually what this slide is about with the underlying difficulty, which is that debt challenges in low-income countries have risen. We have now 39 countries out of the 69 PRGT eligible countries that are assessed at high risk or already in debt distress compared to only 19 at the end of 2015. COVID-19 has not created the situation, as we know. The trend started well before, as you see on the graph, which shows the repartition of low-income countries according to their risk of debt distress, the green bars being countries in low risk of debt distress, yellow moderate risk, red high risk, and black countries already in debt distress. The move started well before COVID, but certainly COVID has further exacerbated debt challenges. So to protect fund resources, but also to avoid adding another layer of debt without resolving the underlying difficulties, the reforms approved in July included specifically the need to develop in future programs a deeper analysis of debt composition and debt dynamics. And for countries at high risk or already in debt distress, program objectives will have to include a concrete reduction in debt vulnerabilities over the medium term. Second component of the package is the funding strategy, and I will pass the floor to Charlene. Thank you very much, Guillaume. Before I begin, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me well. Yes, I think Perfect. you could. Perfect. Thank you, Liam. And thank you very much, Guillaume. Before I discuss the PRGT funding strategy to support the reforms that Guillaume just described, let me say a few words about its financing framework. PRGT lending is supported by an endowment-based financing model that relies on both loan and subsidy resources. Loan resources are provided through bilateral agreements with member countries and on link to the PRGT on a pass-through basis. These loan resources are borrowed from individual member countries and institutions at market rates from official creditors and are lent on a pass-through basis to eligible low-income countries. Resources from PRGT loan contributors are non-revolving and need to be replenished at regular intervals through borrowing agreements. The PRGT's reserve account provides securities to the lenders to the loan accounts in the event of delayed or non-payment by PRGT borrowers. It also plays an important role in PRGT self-sustainability, as I'll mention in a moment. Subsidy resources cover the difference between the market rate paid to loan contributors and the concessional currently zero interest rate paid by PRGT borrowers. These resources come from the fund's own resources and also donor contributions. The subsidy costs to bring interest rates to zero are financed from balances in the PRGT subsidy accounts provided by bilateral contributions and investment income from the and 
investment income from the reserve account will eventually be used to subsidize concessional lending under the self-sustained PRGT. Under the self-sustained model, the resources in the PRGT subsidy accounts would be gradually drawn down to zero, while balances in the reserve account would grow over time by the amount of investment returns on the reserve account's balance until returns on its assets would subsidize PRGT lending in perpetuity. As Guillaume mentioned earlier, we've already seen a large surge in demand for PRGT borrowing as a result of the pandemic, and demand in the coming years is expected to remain elevated. In order to ensure the PRGT is adequately resourced to meet this demand, the IMF's executive board approved a two-stage funding strategy. In stage one, a fundraising campaign was launched immediately following the approval of the lending reforms in July 2021 to mobilize both loan resources and subsidy resources for the PRGT to continue providing zero interest lending to low-income countries while preserving the longer term capacity for the PRGT to lend. In stage two, low-income facilities and financing will be reviewed again in 2024-25, and there will be a discussion at that time on the appropriate longer-term PRGT lending envelope and considerations of longer-term solutions to PRGT self-sustainability, including the possible use of internal fund resources. The resource needs for stage one are about $18 billion for loan resources and about $4 billion for subsidy resources. The loan resources being sought are on top of the about $24 billion already secured since last year. For subsidy resources, the fund is seeking voluntary financial contributions of just over $3 billion from its economically stronger members, with the remainder coming from the use of internal fund resources. To provide donors with flexibility, there are a number of options available for bilateral subsidy contributions, and we are seeking resources pledged up front, which could be dispersed over time, given the need for domestic approvals and procedures. Voluntary channeling of SDRs to the PRGT could help with its resource mobilization needs. For instance, about two thirds of the PRGT loan resources mobilized in the previous loan campaign started last year were provided using existing SDRs. SDRs could also be channeled as investment resources for the PRGT for the purpose of providing subsidy resources. My colleagues Christian and Uma will talk more about SDR channeling, including to the PRGT in the next session. Finally, as part of the agreed package of PRGT reforms, staff will annually review the adequacy of PRGT finances, which will include an assessment of PRGT demand, both backward and forward looking, as well as an update on loan and subsidy resource mobilization. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, Charlene and Guillaume, thank you so much indeed for setting the stage. Um, I know that that will have provoked lots of questions from people watching. Please put those questions um, in the chat because we've got a little bit of time to come back to um, some of the thoughts that you might um, have had. Um, but let me just bring in first two interventions from parliamentary colleagues. If I can go first, please, uh, to my colleague from Senegal, uh, Abu Bakri. Are you there? Are you able to join us now? Oui, euh, je, je, je suis là. Allô, bonjour, euh, bonjour à tous. Perfect, yes we can, sir. Over to you. Voilà, merci. Voilà, voilà. Uh, merci de 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 de, de pré présentateur précédent là. Thank you very much to both previous uh, speakers here in uh, Senegal. We know that uh, what well, the pandemic happened in 2020, and we had already prepared the uh, current budget in October, December for 2020. But we had to uh, reprogram the budget uh, by uh, may. Um, locating other uh, subsidies and other means uh, by the state. So this, uh, the resilience programs were implemented by the Senegalese uh, government, as was the case in other African countries. The, it was uh, set back in the budget, but we have growth rates from four to six percent in Western Africa. And in Senegal, we are 
back to 1% growth rate, and some countries even went through recessions. So uh, challenges increased even before the COVID crisis. We were facing issues, but then there was the COVID, everything was closed, lockdowns and challenges increased. Now, on the 650 uh, billion, Africa only received uh, th uh, 33 billion, 22 in sub-Saharan Africa, Senegal, approximately $550 million. Some say that uh, it's a lot, but, um, and it helped, uh, more would have helped more the most vulnerable countries. It is um, very much not enough rich country should think how to better allocate those resources to the most vulnerable countries, the most prosperous countries and international institutions must go further to support African states to recover from the crisis. Notably, uh, the countries from the G20 who received two thirds of uh, the special drawing rights, 650 billion. So those G20 countries must uh, review their quotas by supporting recovery efforts of African countries, because we have many resilience programs and other schemes to support recovery. Despite the closing of the e economies, many African borders were closed uh, during the crisis. And within each country, it was very difficult to move around. It was difficult for people to go from one region or one department to the other, which led many um, discontent in many countries. People were not able to work and uh, to, to move. So uh, countries from the G20 must support, generally speaking, Africa with extra SDR because uh, they have surpluses that they are not using by supporting these African countries in, on the way to recovery, G20 countries by um, concessional uh, borrow loans or donations must uh, support if they make um, give these uh, funds to uh, these countries or also institutions like the IMF and other such institutions it will help uh, African countries to recover from the crisis uh, President Maxwell went to Paris and suggested that rich countries who have uh, sur uh, surpluses SDR use these surpluses to support Africa so that the region could get uh, 100 uh, billion extra SDR. But it, it's not, it did not uh, evolve since then. It was last August, but uh, nothing happened since then and we know that when there is a crisis in africa it pushes people to want to travel away to migrate irregularly to go to the most advanced countries so i, I don't want to be the only one uh, uh, speaking so i will conclude so to make such an idea something substantive is a uh, key to support vulnerable economies in Africa to face the economic and social impact of COVID. Thank you very much. It's uh, the only ideas I wanted to send across to you during this session. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm really grateful for you for uh, being really clear and really candid uh, about both the urgency um, of this crisis, but also the scale of the response that is now needed and the responsibility that there now is uh, on richer countries to, to do the right thing. Um, but uh, before we get into the Q&A, and if you have questions, please just pop them um, in the chat. I'm really, uh, really pleased that we're able to go to the Honourable uh, Roger Farage, who's going to join us um, from Bahrain. Over to you. Thank you, the Right Honourable Liam Byrne. And Your Excellencies, good evening, good morning, good night, wherever you are. It is an honor to be part of this virtual event and contribute alongside my colleagues 
to share thoughts and opinions on the maximizing special drawing rights to build back a better global economy. The global economy suffered severely from the impact of the corona. This is a well-known fact. Although the rates of death and infections were relatively low in our region, I'm talking about the GCC uh, all as a together. However, the economic damage was great. The subsequent lockdown also proved that the revolutionary technologies were not enough to stabilize the economy and that we still have a lot more to learn about the different factors which can both mitigate and contribute to our economic and human development. In August 2021, the International Monetary Fund approved the global allocation of a special drawing rights, SDRs, equivalent to 650, 650 billion, about sort of 456 billion SDRs. This is the largest SDR allocation in the history of IMF and considered as a booster shot into the global economy after the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal is to boost the global liquidity and help most vulnerable economies, countries to cope with the impact of this pandemic. The IMF has also taken measures to enhance the transparency and accountability in the reporting and the use of SDR. However, there is a problem with the SDR in that they are allocated according to the country's quotas or automatic borrowing rights within the IMF. And the formula for these quotas are heavily dependent on countries' aggregate GDP. As a result, only small percentage, approximately 6% of that 650 billion was allocated to the low uh, income or poor countries, and about 30 went to the middle income emerging countries, and then about 60% of this huge amount went to the high income countries. That do not do not have do not have a short that, that do not have a shortage of the foreign currency reserve, nor any difficulties in borrowing to finance budget deficits. How countries will benefit from the SDR allocation? Undoubtedly, the SDR allocation will provide additional liquidity to the global economic system, supplement countries' foreign exchange reserve, reduce their reliance on more expensive domestic external debts. Uh, uh, countries such as the Kingdom of Bahrain would benefit to a certain extent from the allocation and would help in putting back its economy on the path to the recovery. In general, SDR allocation will help to mitigate economic risks, social fragility, minimize spillovers, and enhance the stability of the international monetary system. We should also work together as one body, I mean the world as a whole, to ensure a fair and just allocation. Today, we have a huge responsibility towards all countries around the globe. We want to build economies that are dependent, not, are not dependent on borrowing and charity. Our aim is to increase opportunities in small and poor countries. Experience has taught us that no matter how generous charity is, its effectiveness is limited in long run. Therefore, we hope that government collaborate with IMF and find a way for high income countries to shoulder in helping low and poor countries. Your Excellencies, the revised SDR allocation would definitely be the way forward for the poor countries. However, the two issues that needs to be tackled today are fighting the pandemic by vaccinating the poor countries' population to free them from the fears of the pandemic and have them to resume their normal life by getting back to their earning activities and economic activities as in general. The second is the question of funds needed to repair the damage caused by the pandemic and assist poor countries to build sustainable economy which cater for their future needs. Both these two are not very complex or difficult the way I look at it, 
to solve, but we need determination and world leadership to do so. I would conclude here by thanking you all for the time allowed to me to talk and your attention. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much indeed for that. And thank you for, for being so clear about the moral and economic challenge that's at the core of this debate, which is how do we ensure a fair and just allocation of SDRs? How do we move away from the fact that SDRs are currently allocated according to uh, historic quotas that reflect some deep and distant history now? Um, and a fair and just allocation means that we've got to somehow move from that legacy position to a situation where we're deploying SDRs against the scale of the crisis um, in individual countries. Um, so um, we've got about another 10 minutes in this bit of the session before we move on to part two um, of our conversation today. Um, but let me just pick up a couple of questions that have already come up in the chat uh, and which have come in to me uh, earlier on. I think the first and most fundamental question is about the scale of rechanneling. So both the G20 and the G7 uh, endorsed calls, uh, indeed helped lead calls, uh, for a $650 billion allocation uh, issue, rather, um, of SDRs. Uh, from the IMF's point of view, what is the perspective on the maximum fraction of that $650 billion that could be safely rechanneled. So none of us are interested in destabilizing the international monetary system, but the um, the fraction of SDRs that are currently proposed to be rechanneled is much much lower than some of the conversations that we were having earlier in the year. So I'd be very interested in just the IMF perspective on the theoretical maximum um, for the fraction that can be rechanneled. I think there's then a, a second question about. What the IMF is seeing um, in the way that countries are able to uh, convert loans to basically grants, whether that needs to be uh, a transaction that can take place at the IMF level or whether it can be something that takes place um, at the local uh, level. Um, there is obviously widespread interest given the high debt levels uh, in grant financing rather than loan financing even if that loan financing is at very low uh, interest rates. So it'd be good to get um, a perspective on that. Um, and then our colleagues from Togo um, put this question, um, which is about what is the impact that SDRs can have on uh, convergence criteria, uh, particularly for highly indebted countries? Um, and what is the um, kind of the legal boundaries of the RST uh, and its implementation, implementation mechanisms. Um, so perhaps um, Guillaume and Charlene, I could ask you to pick up those three questions first, um, and then we'll see if there's time for another round. Sure, perhaps I could uh, pick up the second questions on that. Um, on the two questions related to the, um, I mean, the first one on the scale of rechanneling and the um, impact of SDRs um, um, and the RST, et cetera. Uh, I think I think it's linked to the second part, and uh, Uma and and Christian may uh, jump in um, now if that's okay for you because they would have the broader perspective than only the PRGT subset, let's say, of the um, of the question. On, on the on the debt, on the question on debt, um, you are perfectly right that one of the key challenges um, for the months and years to come is the level of debt in low-income countries, both in terms of volumes and also in terms of um, you know, the um, cost of financing, the level of interest rate. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of challenges there. We are working very deeply, um, and we've been working, of course, uh, for years on that, um, with, with, in particular, the official creditors on the one hand and the private creditors on the other hand to find a solution. As you know, one of the breakthrough in terms of architecture was the decision made by the G20 last year to have a common framework uh, to deal with debt challenges in low-income countries. Um, and to have, for the first time ever, Paris Club creditors and non Paris Club creditors sitting at the same table when it comes to debt treatment. What we've seen in 2021 is a slow uh, implementation, very low implementation and slow implementation of this common framework. Um, so there is a bit of a disapp disappointment there in comparison to the expectations that were set at the end of 2020. Chad, um, 
has uh, uh, received official uh, financing assurances from the official bilateral creditors in June, and we have now uh, also financing assurances from the private sector. That's good news, but it took a long uh, period of months. Um, as you know, Ethiopia and Dambia were the two other countries having requested a, com requested a common framework, and things have not moved uh, uh, on those two countries. So we uh, definitely believe that the common framework needs uh, some revitalization we have made proposals um, to the G20 in terms of how it could be made more efficient, and we will certainly continue to push uh, for that agenda, precisely for the reason you mentioned, which is um, that um, the challenges are very high. Uh, perhaps let me pass the floor. I don't know if it's Uma or Christian for the, or Charlene, if you want to answer on the SDRs. Yeah. Thank you, Guillaume. Maybe I'll, I'll say a few words and then see if Christian and, and Uma want to come in or if we, if we cover off the, the topic in the second session. Um, maybe just to come back to the question uh, about um, loans versus grants at, at the IMF. So, so the IMF is not uh, an institution that, that provides um, grants. We have concessional lending, as you noted, Liam. So it's 0% and it's five and a half years grace, 10 years repayment for our, our extended credit facility and our RCF and slightly shorter for our standby credit facility. Um, one thing that I can say is that during the pandemic, you may recall that Guillaume had shown the grant on debt service relief that was provided by the IMF during the crisis under our Catastrophe Containment and Relief Trust. So thanks to the generous contributions from our member countries, we've been able to provide almost $1 billion in debt service relief to 31 eligible countries during the crisis. So these are, these are resources that have been provided via grants from our member countries, and we're very grateful for that. We are still seeking additional grant resources to be able to provide a full two years of debt service relief during the crisis. And also we want to make sure that this trust is adequately resourced for future qualifying events as well. Let me stop here, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that is incredibly helpful because it just, it helps us clarify that particularly for those um, richer countries which were luckier recipients of significant SDRs, which they don't have plans to use, um, the switch to grant financing probably needs to happen at the, the country level uh, rather than the IFI level or indeed the recipient country level. So just understanding that that is a bit of um, accounting arithmetic that needs to happen at the, the donor level, if you like, is actually um, uh, a very useful perspective. Um, let me just bring in at this stage, please, um, Shaquille uh, Shabir Ahmed uh, from Kenya, who has a question on this session. Shaquille? Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Over to you. Okay. First, uh, good afternoon, good evening to my colleagues. Um, um, I'm, my name is Honorable Shaquille Shabir. I'm a member of parliament of the Kenyan National Assembly. I'm also the chairman of APNAC and GOPAC, that's the African Parliamentarians Against Corruption and the Global Parliamentarians Against Corruption. We are, we network with the uh, with um, parliamentarians all over the world. My comment in, in respect of this is uh, that basically this uh, special drawing rights are, uh, are a form of um, like the Marshall Plan. The one thing I would want to say, this is a unique situation that this world is finding itself in. We're all in the same sea and we're all facing the same problems of the waves and, and all, all, the, all the challenges of, of a turbulent sea, but we are in different boats. And different boats require different, different type of uh, maneuvering and uh, different types of um, trying, to, uh, trying, to, trying to go forward. So my comment really uh, is that, um, this basic uh, as, uh, special drawing rights needs to be seen in the capacity of what they are. It's a special, because like, it's like an economic stimulus package, but that is not one, one for all, one, one, one design or one, one shape for all. It needs to be able to be uh, tailor-made uh, those African countries like ours in Kenya, uh, we have a difficulty. 
of course, it has to be a just and fair allocation. And when you, as you're saying 10% of special drawing rights at the low income com countries, we are already losing out. There is the issue of morality. There is the issue of equality. And most importantly, there's the issue of equity. One of the things that we in uh, uh, Africa find the IMF sometimes and the World Bank and the G20, um, the intentions are very good. Perhaps they do not understand or we're not able to, 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 to fully recognize or understand the particular circumstances faced by our country. Um, the IMF basically are lenders. Whether, whatever you, whatever they are, they are lenders. And their main reason is to be able to maintain a certain equilibrium in the market. Uh, so we must look at it from that point of view and say that yes, we these special drawing rights are not grants, they are loans, whether whatever you call them. And then we need to be able to have a say as to how we could work with them. And do you understand that we all have what is called credit rating? Our credit rating is quite low, but it's, the, it's, it's those countries with low credit rating that actually unfortunately need the highest, highest support. And vaccination rate in Kenya right now is 4%, 4 or 5%. We have what we call vaccination uh, apartheid. Uh, that is what we call it here. Um, I think the best thing to do for all of us countries is to say that, listen, uh, let's let's go for revitalization. Let's not use a shotgun approach. Let's have a, you know, let's have a single shot. Let's look at what we need to do and let's get some quick action. Let's get some quick relief for which we can be able to turn around our economy. Uh, thank Perfect. you very much. And, uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to bring in two more colleagues just very quickly. Um, can I bring my colleague from Senegal, um, Honourable Nagadi, back in? And then can I go to um, Madame Koulibaly uh, Majara, please? Well, Abu Bakri, Deputy, Abu Bakri, Deputy. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm a member of Parliament in uh, Senegal. I just wanted to say that before uh, SDR were allocated in 2021, we uh, inaugurated two uh, level two hospitals and we uh, build an international uh, clinic polyclinic uh, which is managed by the army and we hired uh, medical staff when uh, the D sdr were allocated to senegal our countries asked our country asked that more than 70 percent of these sdr go to health matters senegal before the sdr were allocated was already preparing with dakar in a pasteur institute on the production of uh, vaccines in 2022 so we are getting prepared before the second quarter of 2022, we are making sure that we will have our own vaccines in Senegal. This was an opportunity and 70% uh, therefore for health matters, but uh, even beyond uh, what I uh, just said, the uh, SDR allocated to the G20 must be also reallocated to African countries or at least vulnerable or LIC, because as my colleague from Kenya said, uh, this pandemic led to, how should I put it? We have only five to 6% in our country of uh, vaccinated people. So it's, it's not enough. So we are going to uh, create our own vaccine and vaccinate uh, uh, people, but also export as uh, Ivory Coast is doing, Cote d'Ivoire is doing, and other countries are doing, exporting to our uh, fellow neighbor countries. Uh, but uh, it, it would be more, it's important to allocate also to uh, Africa and to help Africa, but it must also come from international institutions and from developed countries. Here is what I had to add. Thank you. Mm, that's extreme, it's extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, um, Madam Majara, can I bring you in now, please? Yes, uh, bonjour, Liam. Bonjour. 
Yes, hello, hello Liam, hello everyone. I am Kulibali Maikara, member of parliament of the Congo region uh, in the north of Côte d'Ivoire, and I am part of the Defense and Security uh, Committee, and it's a pleasure for me to take the floor this afternoon here for this uh, session. I thank you wholeheartedly for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk on the special drawing rights allocated by the IMF. The goal is to make it possible for all countries to face the impacts of COVID-19 on their economies. This pandemic weakened the economic systems of several countries where the economy was not going so well even before. Most support is allocated depending on the uh, weight of countries by the IMF. We, we do understand that uh, in this framework that underdeveloped countries, mostly uh, in Africa, because it has tens, 10 of the most uh, fragile countries, we lose even more and we'll have to rely on support from better, more richer countries. $33 billion for Africa is only 5% of global allocations. It should be underlined that even if several countries have been making efforts to limit the informal sector in their economy, which is 25 to 60% depending on each countries. But ma many uh, efforts remain to be done. So I salute France and its willingness to redirect 20% of the SDR, which will be allocated to it, to reallocate it to Africa. And we don't receive uh, help uh, such as this one from all industrialized countries based on the SDR. Then I believe that if SDR are allocated for economies to face this pandemic, the distribution should be fairer. We also understand that the uh, special drawing right make it possible to uh, give currencies to countries without further help. But all countries, every country in the world is uh, uh, impacted, directly impacted today, of course. But why not supporting further those countries who hardly can face the impact of this uh, pandemic? And depending on the country, um, the measures uh, put in place will always be different. Some will fight the disease, others will um, build infrastructure. But is it really the goal of the IMF? And I'm asking the question, we are in a globalized world. If we don't receive uh, sustainable support, uh, we will be in the same degrade, uh, degraded uh, economic situation that was the case before. Thank you very much indeed for your intention, uh, attention. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, well, um, Guillaume, uh, Charlene, let me come back to you uh, for some answers to those questions and any wrap up thoughts you have. Um, I think there are kind of four takeaways from what you've heard so far. One, real appetite for a fair and just allocation. Uh, two, there's a very strong theme through the comments that we've heard that people are looking for help with the financing of an exit from the crisis. So most of the comments that people have made today are very crisis centric. Um, before we get into the question of infrastructure, there is a, a crisis to exit from right now. Um, I think we've heard from you loud and clear that uh, PRGT has obviously scaled up incredibly quickly. Um, and if we are to make even further faster progress from that, uh, we need to revitalize some of the frameworks around debt transparency so that we can see the context that we're lending into a little more clearly. Um, and then that final insight that you've helped us arrive at, which is that if there are to be SDR to grant switches, then that probably needs to happen um, at donor level rather than um, IFI level. Um, but let me um, ask you to kind of wrap up this half of the session uh, with any kind of final thoughts and observations and answers to what you've heard. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Liam, and, and thank you to everyone for the um, contributions um, and, and comments and questions. Um, I think I think indeed the four elements that you um, um, uh, mentioned um, um, right now are exactly aligned with what I was um, about to say. I think there are four items uh, in my view where, broadly speaking, I think I think we converge. One is that the needs are very high. Need to tackle the pandemic. It's not over, definitely needs to jumpstart the economies, and needs to finance development. As I mentioned in the beginning, our assessment is that $200 billion are needed for the five years to come to respond to the crisis, and another $250 billion um, to accelerate income convergence. The second thing is that debt are elevated. You mentioned debt transparency, and it's clearly a problem. Uh, debt is not always transparent. There are in the debt, there are problems in terms of access to data. But in any case, that are elevated, which leads to the third point, which is that the financing options are limited. And the fourth point is that there are SDRs that are not used, um, and the vast share of the SDRs will not be used uh, because indeed the allocation uh, rules were what they are, um, what they were, and, 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 and will not be used um, if they are not redirected and rechanneled which is what we are doing, what we are trying, what we are pushing, and what will happen one way or the other um, if there is a willingness to respond to the call to rechannel and redirect the SDRs that are not used to the PRGT on the first hand, to the RST on the other hand, and that will be the purpose of the second uh, session. Will that solve all problems? No, for sure. As you mentioned, those are loans. Those are not grants. Debt challenges will not be resolved only through uh, uh, this redirection of SDRs, for sure. So there is a need to accelerate the implementation of debt treatments where needed, not necessarily only for situations where debt is unsustainable. There are also uh, a number of countries which would benefit from a reprofiling of their debt with uh, you know, uh, maturities pushed uh, for the future um, uh, freeing some space um, uh, to support the recovery and development in the short term. And all of that is feasible if the official bilateral creators accelerate the implementation of what they agreed last year with the common framework. So let me stop here and, and over to you. Lovely. And thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, Charlene, anything to add to that? No, thank you very much for the opportunity, Liam, but I think there's a, a lot of interest in, in SDRs and how they can be channeled. So I'll, I'll cede any time to my colleagues to come. Perfect. Okay, that's really kind. So we're going to um, click into the second half of our session now, and I'm delighted that um, Uma, who the Deputy Director of the Strategy Policy and Review Department at the IMF, is going to lead off. And then we have Christian, um, who is the Deputy Director of the Finance Department. Um, let me just say a word really to set the stage for the second half of the discussion, which is that um, many of us in Parliament in richer countries remain incredibly interested in what is the right kind of target, what is the right fraction of the SDR allocation that we've received uh, that we should be rechanneling. Um, and second, give us your thoughts on the channels into which this um, SDRs should move. So we've heard a little bit about PRGT. Um, we're really interested in what you've got to say about RST. Um, but I think a lot of our colleagues in multilateral development banks uh, in Africa and elsewhere um, are also making the case to us about the way in which they are legally able to uh, take receipts of SDRs and how they may also be able to leverage and therefore multiply the impact um, of SDRs in Africa um, and elsewhere. But Uma, let me hand the stage to you first for your remarks. Thank you very much, Liam. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here and thank you very much for hosting this session. Um, so I'll, uh, Christian and I will share this. Um, we are both working on the channeling. I will start with some of the details on the channeling for RST and then Christian will carry the uh, expanding a little bit more on the PRG team. So as you know, um, SDR is an international reserve asset that was created by the IMF um, to supplement members' um, international reserve assets, official reserves. The value of the SDR is based on a basket of five currencies. And as many of the speakers have already noted, um, the allocations are based on the relative shares of the member country um, in the IMF. 
Um, so to date, SDR is equivalent to about US dollars 943 billion have been allocated, including the latest 650 billion that happened in August. Um, the August allocation indeed was historically the largest that we've done, ever done. And this was in the context of the needs of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, of this about 275 billion of the recent allocation went to emerging markets and developing countries and about 21 billion went to low income countries. Um, while it may seem that these are small numbers relative to the 650 billion allocation, I would add that um, the, uh, this is not a small sum for low income countries. Uh, for some countries, on average, it represents about 2.7% of GDP in additional reserves for low income countries, which is a significant amount. Um, and it is important that the SDRs be used in the most um, um, best possible way for the member, um, be it for managing reserve buffers or for fiscal spending, including, as we have heard in, the, uh, in today's discussion, vaccine financing it may be uh, relevant for use. What is important, however, is again, going back to the debt transparency issue that you raised, but broader transparency in how the SDRs are used and accountability and good governance would be important. And in that context, the IMF would be reporting to our executive board in two years with a review of how countries um, actually did use their allocation that was just made. Um, so now with the SDR allocation done, the next challenge for us is how to magnify, like you've been discussing uh, in the earlier session, how do you magnify the impact that this allocation has had um, so that it reaches the regions and countries that are most need, have the most pressing need. So several shareholders uh, with strong external positions um, have expressed their interest to voluntarily channel some of the SDRs that they have, that they um, were allocated to help poorer and vulnerable countries. The challenge for us now is to ensure that this channeling is geared towards where there is greatest need. So we've had multiple dis discussions. We've gone through several rounds of discussions with various stakeholders inside, uh, inside the IMF, outside the IMF, with shareholders, other institutions, um, uh, many CSOs, et cetera. And uh, three options came, uh, were put on the table for consideration. Uh, one, of course, as Charlene and Guillaume have been talking about, uh, increasing the size of the PRGT, uh, which will enable more lending at zero interest rates. Um, so that's the first option. Christian will elaborate more on that. The second option is to establish a new Resilience and Sustainability Trust, or what we call the RST, uh, which I will elaborate a little bit more um, in the, um, as I go along. And the third option that we put on the table is for channeling um, to prescribed holders of SDRs, including MDBs like the World Bank and the African Development Bank, et cetera. Now, on the third option, what I would say is the role of the IMF per se is limited in that because it is not channeling through the IMF. So it is really up to the holders of the SDRs, which are the creditor countries and the development banks like the World Bank or the African Development Bank or other prescribed holders to be able to figure out what is the best use for that SDR that the, but that the development bank, bank can put to use. So the proposal has to come from there, not from us. What we are able to provide is the technical support that would be needed in sort of explaining how the SDR works, how we have created the trust, et cetera. So we are able to provide technical support in building what might be proposals that might come from either the MDBs or the SDR holders themselves. So I just wanted to put that in context, um, you know, in case, in case there are questions in that regard. Now coming to the RST itself, which is the trust that we are working on now. Um, First, I want to um, emphasize that we have had uh, several, uh, a couple of informal discussions with our executive board, but the RST itself is not yet approved. There is broad support to come up with details and develop the, the, what the trust might look like, but it is not there yet in terms of a legal entity. So what I can provide today is some of the broad contours of what we are thinking rather than what the specifics would look like. So um, as background, as we've been hearing also this morning, the pandemic has um, exacerbated <coughs> economic divergence across countries and inequalities are rising. And at the same time, many countries that are, um, are facing major threats from the pandemic are also um, 
have slowed down or have not been able to make progress in achieving some of the long-term sustainability reforms that are needed and the pandemic is setting them back further, which are exacerbating some of the long-term risks that might be arising, including, as we've heard recently from the COP26, climate change is a huge risk. So if these vulnerabilities are not addressed, they could potentially jeopardize future social, economic, and external stability, or what we in our sort of technical lingo call prospective balance of payment stability um, of the member country. So uh, a key reason why long-term challenges countries have not been able to address is because of the lack of affordable long-term financing. So in that context, we are looking at whether the SDR channeling, and we think it offers a, a historic opportunity to facilitate such structural reforms that have been long due, overdue, but have not happened. And the pandemic is setting it further back. So are we able to channel the SDRs in order to address some of these long-term challenges um, in order to help poor and vulnerable middle-income countries at a time when policy space is limited and financing is scarce? So that's the broad context in which we are approaching um, the design of the RST. So the RST at this, you know, the way we are thinking about it, it could be a third leg of the IMF's lending toolkit so we have one leg, which is what we call our general resources account, which is available to all the members. And then we have the second leg, which is the PRGT, which is available to low-income countries. And so this third leg, if it were to be created, the RST would be supporting a group of members, poor and vulnerable middle-income countries, um, with, with a longer term maturity lending. So the current maximum duration under the so-called GRA and the PRGT, the maximum duration is 10 years. And under the RST, we are looking to um, see if the lending can be done at a much longer duration than the 10 years. We're looking to, you know, can it go up to 20, for example, and at more favorable terms that are currently than that are currently available. And with a view to encourage finance policy reforms that will help build resilience and sustainability. So this is the first time that we would envisage lending at maturity beyond 10, 10 years. And so this is new breaking ground for us and we are excited uh, in this context. Um, the qu question of eligibility I thought was raised. The way we are thinking about eligibility is that it should be broad enough that you're able to target countries that are most in need. At this point, we are thinking that all low-income countries would be eligible all small states would be eligible. And by small states, we mean countries with less than 1.5 million population and a subgroup of well, middle-income countries um, that would be, um, you know, there are various ways to think about what would the subgroup look like. It could be an income criterion where we look at some threshold of income that would be a cutoff for middle-income countries to qualify. Uh, we also thought about whether we should use a market access criterion in order to make, uh, you know, qualify, uh, to make eligible, sorry. And so, you know, these are things we still have to iron out and we are in discussions with our board on the best proposal um, that will fly. Uh, now, access to the RST financing um, we are, will be calibrated, by, you know, there will be several metrics that will feature in the calibration of how much financing countries can access from this trust but an important variable that we will need to take into consideration is of course debt sustainability. All IMF lending mm -hmm. takes debt sustainability, it's, it's front and center um, because we also, you know, like we said, the IMF does provide only loans. It's not a grant-based institution. And so we would not want to also overload countries with too much debt. So we need to calibrate this carefully so that uh, we are able to strike the right balance to help the country without overloading on the um, debt side. Um, so we also expect that the lending from the RST would be part of a broader international effort to address the structural issues. So what this means is that the lending from the RST per se may be modest relative to the financing needs of countries, but the idea is also that the RST would be able to catalyze, mobilize additional financing from other institutions, including other NTPs and the private sector. So the idea is that, yeah. you know, like yeah. we do in our traditional financing, that we are able to sort of bring in other players to be able to um, finance the needs of countries. Um, in terms of the use of the financing from the RST, the main idea is 
to uh, is for the RST to provide significantly more support for policies that are transforming countries. Uh, for example, into the new climate economy to help countries build climate resilience, we would see as one purpose that is gaining traction across our shareholders. But other purposes, other uses for financing uh, could also be considered. And we, you know, again, when we go back to the board for further discussion, we would be discussing further what might be other uses um, of the RSD financing that may, that may uh, come down the road, including preparing a pandemic preparedness. Um, now, given the long-term challenges um, that the RSD is likely to address, we expect that the financing from the RSD, we will be collaborating co closely with other development partners, including the World Bank, um, so that we are able to leverage our relative expertise and relative mandates, so that we are able to provide the best advice to our members. Um, so that's broadly where we are in terms of the broad features. I'm happy to answer any detailed questions that may come up, but let me hand it to Christian, if it's okay with you, Liam. Uh, to, to go a little deeper into where we are on the um, PRGT and the financial architecture of PRGT. Thank you. Brilliant. Th thank you so much. That was an excellent and very thorough overview. Thank you. Um, Christian. Uh, yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to focus a little bit on um, the specifics of how SDRs are used in the uh, fund operations. And, and maybe the, the main message I want to pass on is that the SDRs actually play quite an important role in the fund support to lower income uh, and um, uh, vulnerable middle income countries. And there are really three aspects to that. Uh, the first aspect was already discussed. It is the allocation itself that does provide a certain amount of uh, freely usable resources that are non-debt creating to all of our member countries in proportion to their quota shares. Uh, the second channel um, is a very well-established uh, trust fund that essentially is our zero interest lending arm, uh, uh, where uh, as Guillaume and Charlene uh, were discussing, we have 69 eligible member countries. And during the pandemic, uh, this PRGT has actually supported 53 of them. And we expect that total lending via the PRGT could reach $30 billion um, over the sort of the pandemic and recovery period. Um, and if you add to that the blended financing, that's overall $50 billion in support for low-income countries uh, via our uh, sort of standard standard uh, PRGT operations. And now, of course, this is unprecedented. It's far larger than the types of financial support we provided even in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. Um, and therefore, we have to uh, fill this pretty sizable resource gap. And that's where the SDRs come in. So in July, we had a board meeting uh, where we put together a big package of reforms and financing. That is what Guillaume and Charlene had discussed. And just to give you a sense of how the SDRs come into that. So of the um, uh, loan resources and the subsidy resources, SDRs can really help in mobilizing them from contributors. In particular for loan resources, traditionally about two thirds of the loan resources for the PRGT uh, are mobilized from our uh, member countries, from our contributors in the form of SDRs. And then we have created new accounts for subsidy resources where SDRs can be invested uh, for generating uh, investment returns that then can be used to subsidize our uh, lending rates down to zero for the PRGT. Um, so that's that's roughly the uh, the mechanism. Of course, let's not forget the other side of the SDR, which is that the recipient countries that would get uh, financial support from the fund, they will, uh, of course, have the option to receive SDRs, but they also have the option to receive other currencies based on their uh, preferences and needs. And basically, we have a voluntary trading arrangement uh, market where uh, and participating IMF members can exchange 
um, SDRs for currencies and vice versa. So um, that's that's for the uh, that's for the PRGT, but uh, maybe one important detail about the SDR itself I should emphasize. So the SDR is really an official reserve asset. So it, it, it's only traded between uh, member countries and the IMF and prescribed holders. And it has essentially two sides to it. It has uh, the, S so each country has SDR holdings and each country has an SDR allocation. And both the holdings and the allocation uh, carry an interest rate, which is the so-called SDR interest rate, which at the moment is actually very, very low, uh, almost close to zero. Um, and that means that uh, at the time of allocation for each country, those two flows, they, they cancel out. And um, so one, one could ask, so why aren't richer countries simply donating their SDRs to lower income countries? And, there, and there, there are two reasons why this hasn't happened. One reason is that uh, actually the holders of SDRs in many countries are central banks and they simply do not have the mandate uh, to provide donations. Any donation would have to go through development budgets. So that's, that's one aspect. So typically SDRs are held by central banks or agents of the treasury which, which do not have the mandate uh, to donate SDRs. Now, the second aspect is this uh, issue of the interest rate. So if you were to donate your SDRs, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the member donating SDRs would still have the liability and still continue to pay uh, interest rate. So therefore, it is generally much more efficient when it comes to grants to go via the budgets and not via the SDR holdings. So again, when we talk about the need for substantial grant, based support to, to low-income countries. And by the way, we have provided significant grant-based debt flow relief through our so-called CCRT during the pandemic. Uh, that typically has to come from donor budgets and not from the SDR location. So, so again, uh, the SDRs are useful, but they are generally used in the PRGT uh, mostly for, for, for the on-lending um, and potentially also for investment. So maybe just let me end on saying a few words on the RST. As Uma said, at the moment, this is the uh, design stage. So we, it doesn't exist. It will take some time to put it together. Uh, of course, we are quite hopeful uh, that it will happen. It would be a major step forward for the IMF. As Uma mentioned, it would be the first time that the IMF might provide loans that go beyond the 10-year maturity of all the other IMF loans. So the RST could be much longer maturities, and uh, therefore they would be they would have a high degree of concessionality because again, uh, uh, the rates associated would be would be very low um, together with long maturities. So for the RST, the SDRs are absolutely vital. What we envisage is that the RST would be financed through voluntary contributions. Uh, from member countries uh, of their SDRs. And the challenge for us is how to essentially uh, build this trust fund uh, from, uh, from scratch. And the concept that we are thinking through is a combination of, um, uh, of loan resources, deposit resources, and then also capital contributions from donors, and then relying on a sort of a multi-layered a risk management structure to ensure that the SDRs that contributors provide to the RST are safe and, and, and then are channeled in an uh, appropriate way to beneficiary uh, countries. So um, maybe let me end then by saying in terms of magnitudes uh, in the PRGT, SDR channeling uh, could be sort of, uh, if you think about, let's say the next uh, five years or so, we are talking perhaps between somewhere between 30 and $50 billion channeling to the PRGT. And for the RST, of course, it's very, very early. So I, uh, uh, but I, I, I'm just gonna say that the, that the magnitudes could be potentially of SDR channeling could be potentially similar. Uh, to the magnitudes in the in the uh, in the PRGT, so you so then the you know, IMF essentially has has two trust funds, both of which could channel uh, sort of 
fairly substantial amounts of F SDRs um, over the coming years. Let me stop here. Christian, that is incredibly helpful. Just um, one very quick question. So um, you mentioned $30 billion um, from PRGT over the course of the pandemic, $50 billion of blended finance um, from more standard funds. Um, are, there, are there pledges now in place to back all of that or is there still a small gap? There is a significant gap, so not a, not a small <laughs> gap. So, <laughs> so maybe just, I think Charlene uh, elaborated on this. So that, um, essentially what we, well, it's a big lift. It's a big lift for our members. And yeah. so that's why in July, we approved essentially a two-stage funding strategy. And stage one involves mobilizing um, immediately another roughly um, $18 billion in loans. Mm we are pretty confident that we can get there but we are not there yet uh, in terms of pledges yeah. but the much bigger lift are the subsidy resources so charlene mentioned that we are looking for about three billion dollars in subsidy resources so that's the very difficult yeah. bit we have gotten uh, some very yeah. um, positive responses that there are a number of countries that uh, have already indicated that they will provide their sort of fair share of the subsidy resources um, but what we have done is to basically give contributors not only um, some time to provide the subsidy resources, so, so we, we, we are sort of uh, allowing for contributions and tranches over several years, but we're also giving them different methods, including um, subsidized loans, which uh, one uh, important contributor is, uh, is is using as a tool to provide subsidy resources, as well as uh, as well as investments. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And of course, even if we reach your wildest dreams of fifty billion dollars into um, into PRGT and fifty billion into RST, I mean, we're still only talking fifteen percent of the um, new issue, which is being rechanneled. Um, right, we're running out of time, clock is against us, so um, uh, can I come to um, Shaquille Shabir Ahmed um, for your quick contribution um, on this session, uh, and then if there are any quick questions, we will try and get them in under the wire before the clock hits half past. Please put those questions um, in the chat. Um, Shaquille, can I come to you? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Gareth. You know, I've been following this thing with great interest, and I actually I don't think I have much to add. I have. It's a been a great session, add. actually. Yeah, it's been a really good session. And and I think just to speak for the sake of speaking, I don't think I would want to do that. I have learned a tremendous amount, and I think we are now trying to gauge ourselves. Uh, countries like Kenya and uh, we, as the leaders um, in uh, in these developing countries, need to be able to understand the. Uh, we need to understand the mechanism, we need to understand the rationale, we need to understand what IMF is trying to do. And, uh, and through yourselves at the parliamentary network, we would hope to be able to take advantage of, of our networking. Um, those are the only remarks I have to say. Yeah. I want to well, thank let, you let, for let me, let me just um, let, let me just put a question to, to you first, just um, to elicit this perspective. I mean, if we do get into a situation where we've got a successful RST that um, is lending on on twenty year terms, how how clear is the debate in your country, for instance, um, about where that kind of loan financing ought to go? I mean, do you think the priorities will be around building back public services such as educational health systems, or is it in climate infrastructure, or wh wh where do you see the debate? We, we, we see our debate to re restart our economy, to re rebuild mm. the, the right. capacity that we had, perhaps. Uh, climate change, of course, has its, um, has its um, uh, point, is, uh, has something that we have to do. But we see most of this to go back to building of infrastructure so that we can start, start, um, start developing and, and building a wealth, a wealth um, bu building our... Uh, capacity to to return to where we were before COVID. Perfect. OK, that's that is really you know, interesting. Like, like, uh, countries like us, we, we depend so much on the services of tourism and so much on other services. It is a critical 
that we rebuild our tourism, we rebuild our fo forest, we rebuild our, uh, our uh, national parks and other such foreign, in foreign uh, exchange earning capacity. Yes. Yeah, super. Okay, we've got a few more minutes. Does anybody want to just raise their hand um, and come in quickly for a question before we hit half past? I'm going to rely on you, Gagana, to tell me. Um, thank you. Uh, Rosalia Biro. Yes. Hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here. Do you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yes. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I am the chairperson of Foreign Affairs Committee for the Chamber of Deputy of Romanian Parliament, and we have also the Committee of Sustainable Development, uh, 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 and uh, I, I chair it. And this is the reason why I... Um, uh, have a, um, uh, let's say a question. Do you think that is important to uh, analyze the whole um, uh, uh, SDGs and uh, the whole um, uh, process of recovering based on sustainable development goals? And um, um, uh, now when uh, we are in the era of sustain sustainability revolution, when we have to move forward with uh, uh, the speed of, uh, let's say, digital revolution, maybe is um, um, uh, we need to focus on a, a holistic approach uh, to have uh, more uh, results in uh, using these uh, funds. And uh, just um, uh, sentence again, uh, to thank for the IMF members and the staff for uh, uh, and congratulated for the much needed allocation of uh, spatial drawing uh, rights uh, to help individual countries. I think it is, it is a, a huge, huge opportunity for everyone. Thank you very much. Perfect. And can I, and can I just ask in, in your country, um, where do you think the priority, where do you think the political debate would point the point to for the need for longer term financing i mean again is it public services is it infrastructure is it restarting the economy exiting the crisis do you think that consensus is there um in my country uh, we need uh, first of all to um to develop our infrastructure because um, unfortunately we didn't um, uh, make this uh, till now, first of all. And the second, um, uh, second, I think that uh, in my country, in, in, in this region of uh, Eastern part of Europe, uh, we have to uh, put an accent in developing the private companies, the SMEs, because this will be, a, um, let's say, a force of the uh, whole economy recovering. Brilliant. Okay. Well, look, that's been incredibly helpful and enlightening. So we just got a couple of minutes before we um, before we hit half past. Uh, Uma Christian, any final comments you want to share by way of wrap up? Um, and I'll, I'll I'll have a go at posing this question just for the last time. Um, are are there economic obstacles to richer countries sharing a hundred percent of their SDRs? Is that a constraint that richer countries should worry about, or actually should they feel fairly free in sharing back, not 15% of their SDRs, but 100%. Um, but Uma, perhaps you want to kick off and um, Christian, uh, why don't you bring us home? Yeah. Um, thank you, Liam. And also for the feedback that we're receiving um, today. You know, SDR channeling is a voluntary process, as Christian was saying. So, you know, it is really up to every country to go through the political processes or meet the domestic requirements that would be needed in order to channel the SDRs. So, you know, while there may be no theoretical maximum, I think there may be practical um, and political. A political, a political maximum. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So there, you know, so those hurdles are beyond what we are able to talk about. Yeah. And so, you know, that's where I think your roles are important um, in being able to carry forward some of these messages. And, you know, that's one thing from the creditor standpoint, but from the debtor standpoint or the borrowing country standpoint, you know, I was saying earlier that access to the amount of financing from the RSD, one of the considerations will be debt. And you know how much borrowing countries already have uh, incurred in terms of their debt and the size of the debt, debt sustainability, et cetera. So to the extent that countries have borrowing constraints because their debt levels are so high, you know, even if the size of the 
trust is, is huge if the countries are hitting their debt ceilings in terms of their ability to take on more debt. That's a factor that also needs to be considered from the borrower standpoint. So I think there are, you know, these are the trade-offs that we need to think about. Um, you know, should we be creating such a giant trust, but nobody uses it because they're running into their debt ceiling. So, you know, we can, so we think about it from all dimensions. So that's how we are calibrating um, that. So that's what I would say. Perfect, that's super helpful. Great, thank you. Christian, anything you want to add to that? Uh, yes, um, there are actually a couple of uh, reasons why uh, the, the, the sky is not quite the limit for, for uh, channeling and lending SDRs. The first one is clear in the PRGT. We want to extend the PRGT loans at zero interest. So every loan comes alongside with a subsidy. And the subsidy, as I explained earlier, would have to come from contributors' budget. So that's kind of, so there is a kind of a, if you think about it, kind of a ratio of loan to subsidy that you can calculate. So the larger the loans, the larger have to be the subsidies, and that's a bit of a constraint. In the RST, uh, setting it up from scratch means also because of credit risk, there has to be some degree of reserves in the RST. And again, the reserves would have to come somehow through budgetary. They, they may be very small. They may be only a fraction of the loan amounts, but there will be some uh, basically capital contributions that will have to be approved by donors budgets uh, and then some donors will also have to score the credit risk on their own if they perceive credit risk obviously we our intention is to create the rst in an essentially uh, in a way that is risk-free for the donors but but in some countries simply they will have to score some uh, some additional credit risk in their budget but it's in particular for the kind of the credit risk coverage and the reserves, there will be have a small percentage of the loans will have to be there and go through budget. So it's not entirely uh, possible to provide these SDRs without any uh, kind of budgetary implications, even if they are relatively modest. Perfect. Well, look, folks, that has been um, more clarity in 90 minutes um, than I've seen in about three months uh, working on this issue in London. So um, to uh, Guillaume, Charlene, uh, Uma, Christian, thank you so much for a brilliant session. Elizabeth, thank you to you and your team at the IMF for helping um, set this up. Um, Gogana, thank you to you and the Parliamentary Network for bringing parliamentarians together um, around this. I think, you know, after the annual meetings and COP, uh, all of us are kind of united um, in really wanting to push much harder, much faster uh, on the financing story that needs to emerge if we are to exit the recovery, build back fairer, stronger, greener, uh, and put in place some of the climate finance um, that we're going to need uh, for the future. This dovetails with work that we want to do in the parliamentary network. Um, again, informed by some of the IMF staff notes going into COP26 uh, about the need for a much better information architecture uh, that goes alongside um, investment from longer term investors like pension savings funds. Um, at the moment, it's really very difficult to um, move the significant trillions in pension fund savings into climate friendly investment because the information is just not there. Um, a lot of the challenges that were put to GFANS on finance day at COP um, uh, really kind of revealed the weakness in, in some of this story. Um, so we think that there are two or three sets of initiatives that we can help push forward over the next um, uh, year, which will be hopefully mutually reinforcing. And of course, we are trying to create a parliamentarian's toolkit, uh, which is the 10 key things that all parliamentarians need to know about. And I think we have just proved in the course of 90 minutes that this is absolutely one of those topics. So thank you so much for sparing us the time. We're really looking forward to working with you um, at the next stages, both those of us in donor countries uh, who are ambitious for our countries to do more um, and to those countries that need the extra help. Thank you so much to everybody for joining us. We will get this um, session up on um, YouTube as quickly as we can so that we can share it around the parliamentary network. Uh, but for now, a huge thank you to all of you. Um, and have a good rest of the week and weekend. Bye for now. Bye, William.